Thanks. Welcome everyone to the public worker meeting today on fiscal year 22-23 planning and capacity building clean mobility in schools or CMIS and sustainable transportation equity project or STEP funds. Um, thanks for your participation today. We hope to make it a pretty interactive work group meeting and we, you know, have a lot of information in these slides and a lot of you know, proposals to share. We really want your feedback and we really want to hear your other ideas. So um, please keep them coming. Today I'm joined by a handful of CARB folks, but the ones you need to know most are Heather Choi and Violet Martin. The three of us together are the leads for these three clean mobility programs, planning and capacity building for Violet, CMIS, uh, Heather for CMIS, and myself for STEP. Heather's going to share a little bit more background on these programs and how we got where we are shortly. But we do have a few logistics and a few getting to know you questions first. This meeting is being recorded and the recording will be available on our webpage in about two weeks. The material for this meeting is also available on the CARB webpage. That's the Low Carbon Transportation Investments Meetings and Workshops webpage. And Ashley is going to chat that link into the chat. We're gonna be using the Zoom raise hand function and the chat box today to hear your ideas. If there are Zoom disruptions for any reason, we'll immediately end today's meeting and send out another notice to reschedule. Um, we can't allow anonymous participants for security reasons. So please make sure your name is clear, clearly written on the Zoom platform. And Heather's gonna go over the specifics about how to raise your hand and how to use the Zoom chat function. But I'll just mention that if you want to submit comments or questions in writing, you can use the Zoom chat feature, but we will be reading all of those questions out loud and addressing them verbally for the benefit of all attendees. Ashley Giorgio, who's also a CARB staff on this line is going to be um, reading out the comments and questions. So please send your comments and questions directly to Ashley Giorgio. This is the agenda for our work group meeting today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about background and past feedback, get into our proposals for the solicitations for these three programs that we're talking about today, and then we'll end with a few next steps. We're gonna be pausing for comments and questions and your feedback throughout. Again, we really wanna hear your ideas, so um, please share them at those times. We also have a handful of polling questions. We're going to use, be using the Zoom polling feature. And when we get to the first poll, Violet will go over how to use that Zoom feature. This is the first of three public work group meetings that are anticipated for these three clean mobility programs. This anticipated timeline is just to give you a hint at what might be coming. It's a projection of our timeline and things may change. We'll try to keep you all up to date um, as much as possible on if, if this timeline changes at all. Um, but just so you know, it's in particular for these three work group meetings, this is the first of three work group meetings. We anticipate two more, one in January and one in February of 2023. And that one in February would be during the public comment period for the solicitation materials. So you'll have a chance to provide input through the public work group meetings and through that public comment period. And we're anticipating that an actual solicitation for these programs would come out in um, spring or summer 2023. Good afternoon, everyone. So as Bree just mentioned, we have three work groups that are planned to occur from now until February. We have already started mapping out the potential items for discussion for each, and we'll refine the agendas based on the input we received. So at this point, we're planning holding these work groups during the same time as today, but wanted some feedback on whether there's a preferred time to weigh in on these discussions. So with that, I have a couple of polling questions to get us started. Um, you're free to answer during the meeting um, using the poll um, features. And it's uh, once I launch a poll, uh, you have an option to select 
the option that most applies to your situation or what you um, think would be best. But um, we also have our uh, poll questions in a survey form. So if you can't participate today or um, you want to look that over again and rethink some of your questions or share those with others that weren't able to participate today, we'll go ahead and drop that or actually we'll drop those polling questions, a link to that in the chat, which I believe she just did. So with our first poll, what we're uh, trying to better understand is what time works best for, for um, future meetings. So I've just launched the poll. And um, again, you just select the option morning, afternoon, or evening that works best for you. Um, if you're answering on the behalf of others, please, um, please do so as well. And I'll just give you a few more seconds. We have about half people, half people here so far have responded. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and um, end the poll now because I see that our responses are pretty consistently um, the afternoon. So we'll keep that in mind and hopefully everyone can see those results. We have uh, two thirds of everyone that's participated in the poll thus far are selecting afternoon. So our next polling um, question, so we have a better understanding of those participating today. Um, which of the following, get this, which of the following most is most reflective of the type of organization you represent? So we have several options here for you to choose from, community-based organization, faith-based organization, local or regional government, non-government or non-profit organization, private mobility provider, school district or local education agency, school transportation provider, transit agency, tribal government, or if you're not listed, um, please choose the other. I will go ahead and in the poll, we do have a pretty um, strong representation from local or regional government as well as non-government or non-profit organizations so that you can get a chance and see what those results look like. And then, so we have a better understanding of those, or I'm sorry, it's, <laughs> we're trying to better understand the regional mix or the geographic mix of those that are participating today. So our next question is specific to which California region um, you are from, Northern, Central, Coastal, Southern, or um, if you are more statewide. And our map here on the screen, um, provide some indication of what we mean by Northern, Coastal, Central, and Southern. Okay, I will go ahead and end that poll and it looks like we have about 30% um, from Southern California here today. Okay. So our last poll before we get into some background on these programs, um, what we're trying to, or what we'd like to ask is if there's any specific grant that you're interested in, 
Um, we will be discussing planning capacity building, clean mobility in schools, and the sustainable transportation equity project. Um, but we're just curious as to whether or not there's one over another that you have interest in, or if you haven't decided, or if there's some other program that you would like to get more information on. We'll be happy to hear, Bree. There's a lot of people interested in STEM. I'm going to go ahead and in the poll and give you guys, everyone here, a chance to see what that breakdown looks like so far. And again, um, you're welcome to take these uh, polling questions if you're participating in a way that doesn't allow you to select these options via the survey link that was posted in the chat. Um, this is also on our work group uh, meetings and events page. So with that, I will um, turn things over to Heather. She's going to give you a bit of background on these programs. Hi. Yeah, thanks, Violet. And um, I guess, you know, what I just took away from the poll is it's a pretty equal um, standing. There's a little bit more to step um, for sure of interest, but it, I'm glad we're here today to help um, bring it all together for you guys. So. A little background first, um, as you see on the slide, the board approved $55 million for fiscal year 22-23 clean mobility investments last month. And these dollars are allocated to projects that will provide zero emission and clean mobility, mobili clean mobility options that reflect what the community wants and needs and where the investments are needed most. So the $55 million will be allocated to the following programs as indicated in the four boxes on slide nine. Five million is for planning and capacity building. 15 million for clean mobility in schools or CMIS. And 15 million for STEP, or, uh, which is sustainable transportation equity project funds. Uh, those three will be the focus for our work group meetings that we're um, doing today. And we will be coordinating closely with clean mobility options that you'll see on the slide has $20 million allocated. But for the most part, um, our meetings are going to be focused on the $35 million outside of the clean mobility options um, project. So let's go to our next slide. There's a couple of other opportunities we want to make sure you're aware of, though. Um, like I said, the, the Clean Mobility Options Program, they have some meetings coming up um, that you can check out on the slide. There's a web pages links. So um, technical assistance and workforce development is deeply ingrained in CARB's funding plan. And we do encourage you to look into these other two opportunities. Uh, cleanmobilityoptions.org is the website for webinars that are designed to provide help applying for clean mobility projects. Um, also coming soon is an opportunity to participate in the development of a new adult education and vocational schools zero emission vehicle workforce training project. The goal of this new training project is to promote pathways to clean transportation jobs by supporting existing programs at adult education and vocational schools. The upcoming work group will include information on the solicitation development and an open discussion for stakeholder feedback. So again, we just, there's a lot that we are doing here at CARVE and um, there's a lot of different places to get the information. So we're just hoping you guys can check out those opportunities as well. Now, um, I want to talk more about what we're here to talk about today, which is STEP, CMIS, and planning capacity building. Both STEP and CMIS grant opportunities were developed as competitive solicitations to direct recipients. For the competitive solicitation process, applicants were required to submit narratives, budgets, partnership structures, emissions calculations, location data, and more in order to, to apply. Both CMIS and STEP solicitations provided one opportunity to complete to com complete the applications to be submitted for consideration. Applications were scored, and the highest scoring applications were then selected and developed into full grant agreements. Eight STEP planning grants were awarded, as well as nine implementation grants for CMIS and STEP. 
all are administered by CARB and are taking place in locations uh, throughout the state, such as Stockton, Oakland, City of Commerce, San Diego, and El Monte. We'll drop the links in the chat now so that you can also learn about the current school or CMS and the STEP projects in action. Um, Ashley, do we have those? Yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, you take a look at those. They're, they're a pretty cool projects. It can kind of give you a, a sense of what or, or the uh, communities are currently doing in, in these areas. And now let's look at fast, past feedback. As part of the annual funding plan process, CARB staff like Violet and Bree and I rely on feedback to develop program requirements. Feedback received previously provided the basis for a proposal before you today. As you see listed on slide 12, uh, there's lots of feedback we've received, such as streamlining the application process to be easier to find and participate in, as well as the importance of technical assistance, partnership development, and capacity building to prospective applicants. And feedback we receive from today's work group will be incorporated in our next steps and will inform programmatic changes that improve the ability of CARB's incentives to benefit communities. We'll pause now to check in with the audience to see if there are any comments or questions on the presentation thus far. Um, we've gone over the background, some past feedback. Uh, you can use the reactions button in Zoom to raise your hand so we can call on you and unmute you so you can speak. If you want to submit comments or questions in writing, use the Zoom chat feature and send to Ashley Giorgio. We will read out the questions and address them verbally for the benefit of all attendees. Now, there also want to remind you to please state your name and your affiliation. Are there any critical issues we should be focusing on? I'd like to hear any comments now. Is there, we see a uh, hand raised from Mike Bullock. Um, anybody else have their hand raised? Give you a couple seconds. And let me find my, all right, well, Mike, it's up to you. I'm gonna unmute you. Unmute. There you go, I can hear you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm representing the uh, Bicycle Pedestrian Committee uh, of Oceanside, California. And um, of course, our view is that uh, walking to work and bicycling to work or school um, are, are really the best, the cleanest uh, modes of transportation. Um, I My bicycle is my primary mode of transportation, but uh, I walk a lot and I do have a Tesla. And I know the Tesla is 65% fossil fuel, so I know that's not clean. Uh, and also, uh, equity means that we should be care about uh, students that uh, really have no chance of driving uh, to school because they're not uh, able to pay the uh, for a car and the insurance and all the all the costs uh, of that. And and uh, the other thing we recognize, uh, and I have authorized myself to speak for them. I'm I'm not the chair of the committee. Uh, I am an officer, but uh, uh, anyway, I I think I'm. Generally speaking, for the way the committee thinks about things, uh, we have uh, made some middles and we've talked about uh, the inequity of pretending like car parking is uh, not a transportation facility and acting like it's not expensive enough to even worry about and acting like uh, it can be for the, the more wealthy uh, uh, students that uh, have an ability to actually drive. Uh, and uh, none of that is true. It, it is transportation facility. It is very expensive to provide, and it should be operated for the financial gain of all the students of driving age. Um, so we don't discriminate against against uh, kids that are fortunate enough to drive to work. They get uh, parking lot earnings, and we don't discriminate against people that walk to work or bicycle to work for whatever reason. They might do that for. Um, because they're environmentalists, or they might do that because they don't have enough money to afford a car. They, they might do it for a lot of reasons. We don't discriminate against them. We shouldn't. I, th that's the cars parking system that we um, advocate for. And um, I guess CARB realizes that we're going to have to reduce driving and we have to do it very fast. And so pricing strategies are something that could be implemented pretty fast much faster than building a great mass transit. Oh, we'd all like to see that. <clears throat> and um, 
So anyway, those those are uh, comments. So I'd like to hear if uh, yeah. maybe I'm maybe I'm at the wrong uh, Zoom meeting because you no. guys are really focused on nothing but electric cars. I don't know. No, you are at the at, at the best Zoom meeting, I think, uh, Mike. Uh, no, we're we're actually not this particular um, focus group that we're or not focus group, but working group we're talking about definitely includes um, biking and walking and active transportation infrastructure and also alternatives to car ownership. So we I have in uh, previous meetings heard uh, heard from stakeholders talking about what I think you're talking about is incentivizing not using a car. So um, like a subsidy. Well, really, really, you know, uh, you know, if, if you um, operate parking for the financial gain of all the students of driving age or, and, and employees at the school also, uh, you're not really incentivizing anything. What you're really doing is providing a, a level playing field. And what you're doing is okay. you're stopping the incentivization to drive. Is right. That's what I meant. And, and so, okay, so incentivizing, okay, good. <laughs> like saying like, oh, if you're not, don't drive a car um, or if you don't need um, a parking spot, then we'll give you, you know, $10 a month. Um, that's actually something that we do at Carver, uh, at our agency is mm -hmm. um, for folks who um, primarily walk or, or uh, ride their bike to work. We um, have access to the parking garage uh, three times a month um, for those days when we do need one. So that way, I don't know, it's just, there's other ways that we've done it too, so. Yeah, you, you know, 15 years ago, that was my primary focus. I was working at Lockheed at the time. And so my focus was car parking cash out. And that's what you're describing, car parking cash out. The problem is when I got down Oceanside, a city councilman, uh, Handled, handed me a floppy disk after I made a, a short presentation on parking. And he said, uh, tell me what we need to do about parking. When I got the disk home, I saw that the transit district uh, was going to uh, convert 10 acres of surface parking at the train station to uh, hotels, office buildings, uh, housing. And so Jerry Curran, the councilman said, what are we gonna do about parking? And so, uh, Long story short, I delivered a paper at the Air and Waste Management Association on a car parking system. Now, this would have to be done by a vendor, and right, you would yeah. identify. So, so it's nothing like a car parking cash out. It's it's wonderful, but it's a little too simple, right. and uh, we need something a little more complicated. Yeah. And and that would be for a vendor, and and you know, a requirements document would have to be written and so on and so forth. That's the kind of work I did at Lockheed. Great, yeah. We'll definitely take this idea and. Um... Uh, we'll put in into our, our list of things to follow up on. Really appreciate your comment, Mike. Looks like we have Lorene, Lorena Garcia with the, your hand up. I'm going to go ahead and um, if you're ready, I'm going to ask to unmute you. Hello, Lorena Garcia from Green yep. Commuter. I just wanted to make a comment because I saw it on a slide previously, but I'm curious what, or maybe this is part of the discussion, you know, on the call, I see a lot of partners. I see Linda Lemon. I see Amy Wong. I see Lauren McCarthy. A lot of partners where we're already in the space, you know, doing car share or doing other options. Um, what is, what are, what are some of the goals of CARBS and, and for this program, the, the partnership development? Because what so often happens is, you know, communities pick partners that maybe can't necessarily facilitate or support the entire project and it ends up that where we've seen it not be successful is you know the parts where public private partnership really falls off and so i'm just curious um because i saw that and that's a hot button option for us as well is that you know we want public private partnership and we want them it to be successful and sustainable and everything like that and i think where i've seen a lot of because we're in a lot of different projects including cmo and other things where we've seen the difficulty is really in strengthening public private partnerships so i'm really interested what the plan is for that okay if yeah. any and we do have some um some slides coming up where we will be uh talking about that so I, I'm hoping that we can wait a little bit. And then once we get to that part, we can really um, engage on that, Lorena. Great. No, that sounds great. Okay, great. So are, you, are we ready to go on to our next slide, you think? Ashley, is there anything in the chat before we move on? And no, other than what Mike had already raised, we're good. Thank you. Perfect, thanks. 
And thank you, Heather. Great start. Let's see if I can move on. All right. So I'm going to start talking a little bit about the proposal that staff have put together for these three programs for this fiscal year. We're going to start by talking about what transportation equity means. This is a critical part to all three of these programs. Really, the, the overarching goal of these three programs is to increase transportation equity. The definition that you see on the slide here, and I will read it out as well, was developed through a public process as part of the first step solicitation, but we wanted to revisit it with all three programs in mind. So from the first step solicitation, transportation equity is when a community's transportation system provides accessible, affordable, environmentally sustainable, reliable, and safe transportation options to all residents, in particular those that have been disproportionately impacted by pollution or lack access to services. Transportation equity is intrinsically linked to access to economic opportunities and occurs when community residents have the power to make decisions about their transportation systems. I can go back to the definition in a second, but before I do, we want your feedback on this definition. Does this align with the way you define transportation equity? And if not, how would you update the definition? I'll give you all a second to look through it one more time and let us know if you think any updates should be made for these programs. You can raise your hand or chat to Ashley Giorgio. Mike, is your hand up from before or, okay. No, I took it down, now I put oh, it back up. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, um, it's not quite enough just to provide these things. It has to provide them in a way that is equitable. Um, it, it's kind of a small distinction, but I think it's really important because um, and money really matters here. Um, and, and so, um, for instance, you can have a free parking lot and people could drive and they could take the bus, they could walk. And so you could say, so we provide all the options. But you're operating, if you're operating that parking as free, and then, you know, the people that work there make less money or uh, the people that, um, shop there have to pay more money whether they drive or not you know that's not equitable even though all those ways are provided for they have all those choices but it's not fair if you really look at uh, the details of uh, what things cost and how people are paying for them got it good point thank you matt smith you, I believe you can unmute yourself. Uh, thank you. Uh, Matt Smith from Navistar, uh, a manufacturer of trucks, buses, engines, uh, located in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, one of the things I see in transportation equity, I think is, is strikingly missing is, yes, you're, you're saying that access to transportation should be you know, cost-effective and affordable for everyone. And, and I agree with that, but at what cost on other levels, i.e., if the transportation is free or at low cost to me, but I can't afford my electricity bill because utility rates have gone up to support widespread electrification or food costs have gone up disproportionately as a result of, of that you know, same sort of scenario, um, let, let's not sacrifice the holistic view of what equity entails. It's not just transportation, but it's, it's food, it's uh, mobility, it's uh, housing, et cetera. So I, I think it may be a little narrow in its scope. Okay, thanks. Yesenia Perez, you can unmute yourself. Hi, this is Yesenia Perez from the Green Lining Institute. Um, thank you for just holding this discussion opportunity to continue to build on this definition of transportation equity. I definitely agree with the last comment that I would like to see 
this definition should include um, the delivery of intentional multi-sector benefits um, defined within the definition. And I also would love to see um, something that speaks to how um, capacity building shows up within transportation equity. Thank you. Thank you. Angelina Rahimi. Hello, uh, this is Angelina Rahimi with Aura Planning. Uh, I have a comment, Bri, you have heard this comment from me before. I'm wondering if we can include delivery of services as transportation equity as well. For, for example, uh, to me, um, electric bookmobile is about transportation equity because when we have mobile library in those disadvantaged communities and they do not need to um, use transportation to get to libraries, libraries or other services can come to them. To me, that's a still transportation equity, but I don't see this um, in these definitions. And if even with CMO and other car programs, I keep asking for um, uh, including those type of projects. And sometimes it is accepted, sometimes it's not. And I'm wondering if we can include delivery of services. As I said, like Bookmobile is one example. Another project that we are working on is Mobile Job Training Center. Um, so again, they are not for transporting people, but they are about bringing services to people. So thank you. Thank you. Very helpful. I see a new hand, Lorena Garcia. I just wanted to add to that, that the statement, I think people have talked about it being a little bit narrow, but kind of acknowledging, and I think that the former speaker or the person who just finished speaking, excuse me, hit the nail on the head when they say that it's, it's about like accessing different things. And so it should be in this statement, acknowledged some of the barriers that exist um, because, you know, there's unique populations and unique barriers out there for populations that need to be addressed. It's not, and that's what multimodal transportation is about, meeting people where they are. And I think it starts with acknowledging that there are significant barriers to transportation for a lot of different types of populations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just want to check Matt and Yesenia, your hands, are those from before? Or did you have anything else you wanted to add? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Mike Bullock, is your, your hand from well, before too? You have anything? Just real quick on timing, um, Bree. Yeah. We probably have time for one more comment and then we should move on. Okay. Good. Thanks. Okay. Um, environmentally sustainable. Somewhere you have to really define that because that's thrown around rather casually. Uh, what it has to mean is part of a overall plan to achieve humanity's climate stabilizing requirements as specified by science. And, and I'm sure Carb knows the first one is in 2030, the next one in 2045, we have to go to zero. 2030, um, that's a little bit debatable, but I think it's a very large reduction by 2030. Uh, we have cut our emissions that way. And of course, cars are, are a huge emitter. So um, that's what environmentally sustainable has to mean. It has to be part of an overall plan to hit that first occurring one. That's, that's the one we're up against. That's why we have a, a code red climate emergency. So we have to achieve that 2030 um, requirement to stabilize the climate. Otherwise, uh, it, out of our hands you know it's uh goes beyond the point of of no return we're, and uh, so we're threatened with that now so thanks um ashley did we have any comments yes. or questions in the chat how many we, we have um two individuals and they're quick okay um, let's do it veronica smith maybe add the word cultural after affordable Culture and customs influence the way that people utilize and perceive transportation. So that was the first comment. 
Um, the second one is from Jennifer Tendick saying, for the second sentence, I would suggest considering just access to opportunity and not just economic opportunity. Thinking about education opportunity, the opportunity to access safe parks and recreational areas, access to health, food, et cetera. Great. Thank you for reading those out. And thank you both for your comments. We're going to um, take all of this and take another look at the definition and bring it back to our next work group meeting. So hope to see you all there. Um, I'm going to move on for the sake of time to the bulk of our staff proposal about the structure of this, the fiscal year 22-23 solicitations. This is going to be a lot of information, so um, please make note of any questions you have as we go. We're talking about three programs at once here, which is kind of a um, relatively new thing for CARB. This shift is um, in an effort to improve alignment across our programs. The, the funding structure that we're proposing for this fiscal year is that CARP has $35 million across these three programs. That's the box at the top. $30 million would go directly from CARB to Clean Mobility in Schools and STEP grantees. We're expecting anywhere from two to six projects with that $30 million. $5 million would go directly from CARB to a statewide administrator that would administer the planning and capacity building projects. About $3 million of that $5 million would go directly to those actual planning and capacity building projects on the ground. And we would expect anywhere from four to 16 projects, depending on the size of those projects. And then the other two, about $2 million would go toward both the administration of the program and to technical assistance that we would be provided to the grantees of all three programs throughout their grant terms. Statewide, the statewide administrator here is important for us to, um, to both help CARB administer a larger number of grants than we would be able to in-house and to contribute valuable transportation equity and planning expertise beyond what CARB has in-house. So based on the funding structure that we have laid out here, our proposal is to have two solicitations that would be happening around the same time. One is for a solicitation for those actual community-based projects, the planning and capacity building, clean mobility in schools and step projects. And then the other, this number two, is the solicitation for the technical assistance provider and planning and capacity building grant administrator. We'll go into more detail about each one of these solicitations. Um, and I just wanted to note that this slide deck uses these numbers one or two in the top right corner of the slides to denote which solicitation we're talking about. So we'll start by Heather and I leading discussions on the community-based project solicitation, number one. And then Violet will close out the meeting with a discussion on the administrator solicitation, which is number two. So this community-based project solicitation would be a solicitation run by CARB combined for these three programs, planning and capacity building, CMIS, and STEP. We still need to work out exactly you know, which parts of the application and process make sense to combine and which don't because of differences in the, the programs and the intent of the programs. And we're going to work through that over the next three worker meetings. But the pots of funding would stay the same. So for example, Planning, planning and capacity building applicants would not compete with clean mobility in schools applicants for funds. The purpose of this combined solicitation is to align requirements, minimize confusion, and hopefully make it easier for applicants to get their foot in the door. We're just planning, uh, we're proposing to pilot this combined solicitation approach to see if it will work for CARB's clean mobility investments in the future. We are trying to ensure that technical assistance will be available during the solicitation. I'm not going to say much about this since as of last week, a request for proposals is available on Cali Procure. The deadline to apply for this request for proposals to provide application technical assistance is January 12th, and the deadline to submit questions about the RFP is December 15th, so later this week. And please share this opportunity with others you think might be interested. 
Okay, so don't be overwhelmed yet by this diagram. I'm going to walk us through it. This is our proposed approach for the community based project solicitation. In this proposal, we would be piloting a phased approach. And this diagram demonstrates that phased approach. The purpose of a phased solicitation would be to provide capacity building support to entities that aren't ready to receive substantial grant funding yet. So to help us identify those applicants that need more help before they're ready for a grant funding, it would be really to reduce the workload for the majority of applicants by, fun by, by funneling them through the concept phase first. We've heard over and over that applications are too complex, they're too resource intensive, and so we're trying to figure out what basic information we could get out of a concept phase that could then help us determine um, potential for funding down the line and could really minimize the workload on applicants from the beginning. And we also want to get a better understanding of um, project interest and program interest and prepare a list of projects that may be eligible for funding in future years. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in on this diagram. This is the top half of that diagram we just saw. So when all interested applicants to any of those three, these three programs would apply to the concept phase. And then they would be um, CARB would review the applications in the concept phase, and they would be directed to a few different places. Four on this top line here for applicants that need more technical assistance, capacity building, or planning support before they're actually ready to receive grant funding, we would direct them immediately to the planning grant administrator and technical assistance provider. That entity would um, provide them with some sort of support in getting them ready to apply for CARB or other um, sources of funding in the future. For an entity that is applying to a planning and capacity building grant, the highest scoring applicants out of that concept phase would move on to a full application phase. In that full application phase, we'd be asking for more detailed information. And then the highest scoring applicants would actually become planning and capacity building grantees and they would have um, they would enter an agreement with the planning and capacity building administrator to receive that funding and, and implement their community-based project. For all other applicants that, that made it to the full application phase but weren't the highest scoring, they would be basically added to a list. Um, or I guess they would they would be notified that they didn't move on, they would be offered a follow-up. And then their application would be saved for potential use in future fiscal years. And we'll get into what that could look like later in this conversation. Going back to the concept phase, for any applicants that were not those highest scoring applicants in the concept phase, but that did apply for a planning and capacity building grant, they would also be notified that they did not move on, they'd be offered a follow up, and their application would be saved for potential use in future fiscal years. So that's the top half of that diagram. I'm going to go down to the bottom half of the diagram here. So you can see that when applicants apply to the concept phase, if they are applying for a CMIS or a STEP grant, the same thing would happen to them as would happen to the planning and capacity building grants. So the highest scoring CMIS and STEP applicants would move on to the full application phase. All the other applicants would be notified that they didn't move on, offered follow-up, and um, their application would be safe for future, future fiscal years. And then the same thing would happen in the full application phase. And those highest scoring applicants in the full application phase would become CARB's direct grantees and enter a grant agreement with CARB to implement their community-based projects. And then this purple box at the bottom just shows that you know for both the concept phase and the full application phase, application technical ass assistance will most likely be provided through that the contractor that we select through the RFP that's out now. All right, that was the diagram. We have a few questions for you all. We're happy to take questions on this proposal as well, but really we wanna hear from you. What are the potential impacts of both a joint solicitation approach 
thinking about combining the solicitation for step C missing and planning and capacity building, and then also the potential impacts of a phased solicitation approach. What should we be keeping in mind? We're also interested in if you have any examples of other phased solicitation approaches that we can look at and to understand, you know, what what works well, what doesn't work well. Please raise your hand if you have a comment or a question. Let's start with Adria. Hi, I'm Adria Fox, Communities for Global Sustainability. And I just wanted to answer the question on what process that works. Um, so the California Energy Commission, they've done this phased approach. And so we just were awarded a grant uh, for affordable mixed use housing, a grant, the Epic Challenge and it's phased. So the first one was the concept phase um, that we were in, and then we submitted the full application. What I really enjoyed about the process is the amount of support we had leading up to the final day of submission um, and asking questions and either calling or getting an email response from the CAM that was assigned to um, manage the grant. And then the other part that I really enjoyed was the ability um, on the financial side, because we're a newer organization, and understanding how the budgeting worked and how to complete the budget. And they actually have a really good template for their budget. And actually, you can't make a mistake. I know on other grants I've submitted, you're creating your own spreadsheet. But what I really enjoyed, and I never applied for a card, but I really enjoyed the process of if I made an error, where was the error and I could find it. Um, and that was even early on in the concept phase where we had to submit, you know, what would this project possibly cost? And then as we got into the final submission, there was a, additional support to make sure we got it right. Thank you. And um, that that grant program, did you say it was the EPIC Challenge? Yeah, it's the EPIC Challenge. The particular one that we were awarded is the affordable mixed use housing in a constrained con in the constrained carbon future. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's a long name, but yeah, <laughs> the epic challenge. Yeah, and they've, yeah, they've kind of mastered that approach to this phasing in. Um, and then they give a scoring. So you can kind of get scored ahead of time, kind of ask questions. And then they give a scoring so you know how you scored on the concept application. And then at the end, that's the other part that I enjoy, uh, like is like, how did we score when we won? How do we score up against the other competitors? And then when, um, and they broke it down into regions. So that might be helpful. I don't know how you're doing yours, but the other part that I enjoyed it, because it's all of California, they actually broke it down into four regions. So each re region was competing for a set amount of resources. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that was really helpful because then you, you didn't feel like you're competing against 500 people or however many people applied, you knew once you, you got into that final phase that you're only competing against these four people in your region. Hmm. Okay, thank you. We're going to take a look at that. Lorena Garcia. I want to piggyback on what um, the previous speaker said when it comes to having the ability to have that kind of feedback along the way. There's opportunities for um, you know, if you, and I, I'm just thinking of some of the process that we've seen in some of the other grant cycles for like transformative climate communities where you don't know that you've not been awarded until the very end. And, you know, it's, it's a quite significant amount of time um, to approval and uh, the award process. And by that time, you know, partnerships could be made or other things could be brought in to make the project more, you know, viable or sustainable or whatever it's missing on that end. Um, and so I don't know if there's an, you know, based on that, um, what you had presented, if there's an option to know that feedback along the way, because I think there are a couple of cities and collaboratives that I can think of in that particular grant funding cycle where had they known that they were going to score so low in certain criteria, they would have done the work to kind of bolster that to either find partners, do the community outreach or what have you, whatever, you know, the situation was. Um, and so I think having that feedback along the way, especially for a lot of the developing projects is super monumentally helpful and can lead to more successful projects being funded in the long run. So. Totally. Thank you.
Ashley, are there any comments or questions in the chat? No, there are not. All right, we've got Robin Marquis. Actually, I'm sorry, I've got one question that came to me. Um, so this is from um, Kyle Wong regarding future funding years. Are the applications saved for future fiscal years given priority over new applications? We don't know yet. Um, there's a lot to be figured out in that, especially in that part of the proposal. Um, I'll just, what I'll say is that um, we, we typically have a good amount of like funding uncertainty in our programs every year because the legislature appropriates funding to us every year um, and we don't have kind of consistent funding yet at least. Um, and so, so we do need to really think through like what that would mean for people and how much we can promise um, to, to people that would be, to applicants that would be on that list. Um, we do have actually some time a little bit later on to talk a little through that more, but any thoughts you have on what would be helpful from an applicant perspective um, would be useful to us too. Uh, okay, Robin Markey. Okay, can you hear me? I was double yeah. muted. Yeah. All right, thanks. Um, this is Robin Marquis at CalStart. So this question comes from my previous experience um, running solicitations. Um, I'm curious for the technical assistance um, leading into the full application phase, if there is more detail on what that might encompass. Um, so TA can can cover quite a lot of things and some other two-phased programs that I've seen, there's a really big emphasis on community engagement and meaningful community engagement. So it starts with kind of conceptually, there's something really promising here and then there's a down select and in that next phase, um, there's more support to further refine the concept, but with that community engagement. And I'm wondering if, if that's a similar structure here. So to your question of examples, um, there are some federal programs. Uh, one is most recently is called SMART Grants. Um, that stands for something I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, and then a large program in uh, New York State that was um, also 100% focused in disadvantaged communities. Thanks. And I think we don't know yet um, exactly how the TA will be structured or what the focus will be. I like that idea. Um, do you have any other any other ideas based on the TA that you've seen working in a phase solicitation? Uh, sorry, Bree, I was muting myself in the middle of that, so it gave me feedback that I was that I've now unmuted again. <laughs> What was your question back to me? Oh, do, do you, so because we don't know yet what technical assistance will be um, included really in the application phases yet, thinking from those, the perspective of a phase solicitation, is there, besides that kind of emphasis on community engagement before, like in that full application phase, is there any other TA that you've seen be really beneficial in a phased approach? Yeah, I think the the other one um, or the other aspect of it was really uh, refining the project sustainability plan. Um, so since we know that, you know, we were talking about budget and <laughs> uncertainty in the future um, and a lot of these these projects need a lot of support to get off the ground, but to operate over many years, um, really trying to shape up, okay, if is there an off ramp for this? Is there going to be more money from CARB? Is there going to be more money from another program, federal? Um, so I think coupling kind of the, is this what the community needs, wants, and is going to serve their needs with, okay, how do we keep this around for the long run? Um, those are two aspects that I think are, are really essential for the, um, for leading into the full application. Got it. Thank you. Angelina Rahimi. Yes, thank you, Bri. Uh, so I guess I have uh, one question and two comments. Uh, my question is about a uh, joint solicitation approach. Um, would that mean that if a community wants to apply for two 
three different uh, kind of uh, pro, um, fundings. Do they need to send just one application if you go with, with a joint solicitation approach? That's my question. And then I have two comments as well. So don't know yet, but um, I think that is a good idea. I think that's something we would aim for to try to minimize the burden of you know applications. Um, so we'll we'll have to kind of see how the development of like the applications comes out. But I think we should kind of we should aim for that. That's that's great. Thank you. And that would be really uh, great for communities. As you know, I'm helping uh, mostly nonprofit and disadvantaged communities with their applications, and that would be very helpful. Uh, for them. Um, my comment one is I was part of like face solicitation in 2021 and uh, for for the Department of Energy, I was just looking for the name in case you are wondering. It's called Low Greenhouse Gas Vehicle Technologies. But um, anyways, uh, for that one, uh, one of the partners was uh, smart and we were able to go to the um, from the abstract to the full application. But one thing that was missing uh, was that during two months, like full-time work on the um, actual solicitation after we passed the first phase, there was no um, help or communication. I heard from one of the speakers that they, that they received uh, um, help and support from the funding agency. I think that would be really great. And even maybe um, I'm just uh, thinking maybe if it is a three phase, uh, that would be better than two phase because it's still the first phase is very easy. It's uh, usually the abstract two pages, three pages, but uh, that's great that not everyone needs to go through the whole process of sending the application. Uh, but then uh, uh, one of the reasons that they didn't give the funding to us, one of the reasons was that we are in California and California already has a lot of funding for, for clean mobility. And um, I was thinking, okay, you could tell that to us like <laughs> two months ago. <laughs> so uh, if if there are um, ways that you, uh, again, as one of the speakers mentioned, uh, to communicate with applicants and know what are their uh, weaknesses and their strengths and maybe their weaknesses they cannot uh, complement and they can just uh, drop uh, the process or maybe there's something that they can work on. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I know we have to move on soon. I wanna hear from Lorena and Adria and then we'll move on. I just wanted to make a quick comment to um, an extent to the speaker before and the speaker directly before that as well. I would love for TA to approach um, more comprehensively public-private partnerships because I think that's where a lot of collaboratives, and I'm sorry, my dog is in the background. So I'm sorry if you hear that whining, <laughs> but um. I think I would like to see more resources from a technical uh, assistance standpoint when it comes to creating and sustaining public private partnerships, because I think that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, a lot of times what we see is reinventing of the wheel on some of these projects, but also feeling like there's no support out there when there are a lot of um, private entities and other other funding match match share other ways in which these projects can be developed that I think a lot of um, cities and different types of entities maybe don't have the knowledge or the access to and so having you know again strengthening public private partnership um, and and kind of holding holding the hand a little bit um, because I think that's where a lot of these projects end up kind of floundering is choice choosing partners that are going to be a good fit. Uh, sometimes it's timing, sometimes it's quick deadlines and things like that. But if you can take the time to develop them, you know, th there's a successful way to do that. And technical assistance could, could be helpful in that vein. Thanks. Makes sense. Adria. Oh, yes. And so I had a couple of comments on the people that were talking before. So the first one was, um, they listed the types of groups that would make sense. So ours is a development project. So they listed like, here are the types of people that should be part of your group. So they actually listed to help the people think like, you know, if I'm going to do this, you know, I'm not, you know, someone with an EV car that's going to build a building like here, are the perfect, you know, so it would whatever that category that you're developing for, you should have 
you know, certain types of groups just work better together and it's actually made my grant and the process better um, in actually completing it. So that was really helpful that they actually listed types of partnerships that made sense. And the other thing that um, Adria, you're muted. Sorry, my phone rang. Um, <laughs> the other thing that made sense was um, when they broke the, um, Hey, Bree, um, maybe Adria, we have- a Oop, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. Oh, yeah, um, I was just gonna say, if you, if you need to get a call, but we have other times that we'll be able to-, to Oh, no worries. This is, this is the last one. I thought it was really cool. So the, we have all these, I could be a prime on one, but I could also be a subcontractor on anybody else's um, grant. That was helpful. And then the last one was that they made it California only primes. I thought that was helpful. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, for the sake of time, I'm going to go through the next few slides together and then do um, one more common and question portion before I turn it over to Heather. So, let's see. So I wanted to dig into the concept phase a little bit more. This is staff's proposal. And in this proposal, the concept phase would be required to be eligible to move on to the full application phase and potentially receive funding. This would not be an optional concept phase. The concept applications would be scored by CARB staff. And like I mentioned, divided up between applicants moving on to the full application phase, applicants um, on hold, basically. Um, these are, this list includes some of the things that the concept phase application could ask for. Um, the, these are just some ideas we have about what information will be important for reviewers to understand when making decisions about which projects to move forward. And um, the idea is that this information is also relatively straightforward for applicants to collect. And we would be trying to limit the details that we'd ask for in this concept phase. So for example, we would ask for an estimate of the total budget, but the detailed budget could wait until the full application phase. And we could ask for a description of the partnership structure, but the actual you know letters of support or something that confirm that those partners are on board could wait until the full application phase just as two examples we also wanted to dig a little bit more into what happens to those project applications that aren't selected for funding this fiscal year our goal is to come up with a way to simplify this process so when or if applicants want to reapply when more funding is available in the programs, the process is more straightforward. They don't have to redo all the work that they've already done. We also want to be able to move forward quickly to fund those projects when we receive funding in future fiscal years. And we wanna be able to assess interest in these funder pro funding programs and better understand what types of projects applicants are interested in. That will help us with our future funding plan uh, development and funding projections and demand projections. So if more funding becomes available in future fiscal years, we um, could, you know, keep a list basically of unsuccessful project applications and notify them of future funding opportunities. We want to explore how we might be able to evaluate those applications or maybe an updated version of those applications for funding decisions in future fiscal years. And we'd like to hear your feedback on uh, what to keep in mind and what would be useful for future applicants. So I'm gonna cover questions for on both of those concepts right now. We wanna know, you know, any thoughts you have on what that kind of funding approach could look like for future fiscal years based on this solicitation and any potential impacts that we should be considering. And then, we also, on the concept phase, we want to know, you know, what information do you think is relevant to include in a concept phase? We have some good examples already, but um, any other well-done concept phases we'd really like to hear about? And what information do you think will be particularly challenging to collect in a concept phase that you would not advise we include?
Ja, Mai. Um, you're still muted. Okay. Yeah, in, in terms of um, info that's relevant would be uh, an estimate of the uh, effectiveness uh, in terms of um, reducing vehicle miles traveled or greenhouse gas emissions. Thanks. Lorena, was your hand up from before or did you have another idea? My hand up was from before, sorry. No worries. Any other thoughts on the concept phase? Okay, I think we got a lot of that in the discussion beforehand. So we're gonna move on, um, unless Ashley, there's anything. Um, I did wanna acknowledge Mike's comment from the previous slides just really briefly. Um, he was talking about a good car parking system is fully shared parking. It's value price with congestion pricing algorithm that kicks in as needed. Um, the system provides parking system earnings to those that are losing money because uh, the parking often very expensive is being provided he provides some examples as well. Um, the car um, could be recognized by its license plate or RFID since people don't have license plates, I guess, guess RFIDs would be needed or face recognition. The system could be viewed as a way to unbundle the cost of parking. The algorithms that compute the earnings vary depending on the case. For example, employees, the earnings are proportionate to the time spent at the work site. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna pass it on, whoops, get ahead of myself, to Heather. All right, so we're on slide 27, is that what it says? 28. 28, sorry. <laughs> My screen won't show me exactly what slide we're on, so. Okay, great. Um, all right, so eligible applicants, the proposed list of eligible- Heather, can you move your microphone down to your mouth? Yes, so sorry. Thanks. Sorry about that. Thanks. That's why we're, we're a team. <laughs> the proposed list of eligible applicants on slide 28 is broken down by lead and co-applicants. Lead applicants will be the become the grantee and must either be a community-based organization, a tribe, uh, previously was limited to federal, federally recognized tribes and step grants, a local government and specific to CMUS school districts and local education agencies. We're looking for strong collaborative partnerships to support the success of these projects, as Lorena had pointed out earlier, and project partners will be included as co-applicants. A variety of entity types can serve as a co-applicant, such as mobility providers, Joint, power author joint powers authorities and other public agencies like metropolitan planning organizations and RTPAs. Next slide. Here we have an example of a partnership structure on slide 29. This is a simplified but entirely possible grantee and sub awardee structure to give you an idea of how these work or can work and how um, they can be developed as a project proposal. Our preferred approach is one where communities are making the decisions about the projects in their communities, like the one demonstrated here on slide 29. So we're ready for a, a quick uh, break again for some comments and questions just in this particular area. Uh, what other entities should be eligible? Are we missing anybody? And what are the elements for a successful partnership structure? And um, Lorena, not to put you on the spot, but I think this is where um, maybe some of the comments you had uh, mentioned earlier would be would be good to hear from. So at this point, I will pause. And just to remind you, you can um, use the reactions button to raise your hand for anybody who wants to say something or uh, provide a comment and question, or you can use the Zoom chat feature, send your comment to um, Ashley Giorgio, and we can read it out loud for you. So is there any hands up? That was a quick one, though, right? Okay. 
Ashley, is there any um, questions that are coming in the chat? No, they're not. All right, so should we go ahead and move on to eligible project types? I think I'm going to do it. I'm calling it. All right, so now we're going to talk about eligible project types. Um, planning and capacity building projects are intended to increase transportation equity by improving local understanding of residents' transportation needs, preparing communities to implement clean transportation and land use projects, developing a foundation for organizational and community capacity, uh, community capacity building, and readying projects for implementation. In addition to the planning types of projects, community-based projects can include tangible assets and services like public transit subsidies, car shares, street safety projects, and more. Female Building of Schools, or CMUS, will have a school-focused project, and STEP projects will have a focus on reducing vehicle miles traveled. traveled. These project types are intended to increase transportation equity by addressing community identified needs, increasing access to, to key just destinations like school, work, city hall, and the library. Eligible projects. Um, here's, a, here's just a, a, a brief summary list of the project types that we are thinking of. For fiscal year 22-23, CARB hopes to expand the projects eligible under these programs and ensure that they reflect the types of clean transportation projects that are needed. Slide 33 depicts general project categories staff are considering that would be eligible in each program. Many of the project categories are eligible in all programs in development. For more details on eligible projects and a more comprehensive list of options that we've thought of, we have a handout included in the meeting materials for you today, which Ashley also, uh, uh, I believe it was Ashley, yes, Ashley just also posted in our chat window here. So you can go ahead and click on that link and see, um, I think it's two or three pages of, the, of more detailed projects that we're um, happy to discuss with you today. In addition, CARB may consider other project types outside of this list that meet the tr clean transportation equity goals that are designed by these programs. With that, we have a poll. I have my first poll. So planning, planning and capacity building is very important. It's a very important project category as we think this is where communities can start building the social infrastructure to reach transportation equity. Planning and capacity building projects also provide a pathway for communities to later fund projects through STEP and CMUS. So let's take this poll. What happened to my, my notes? My notes went away. Um, let's see, Violet. Yeah, um, so I, I did launch the poll and just to clarify the question is how much should each planning capacity building grant be up to 200,000, up to 500,000, up to 750,000, or maybe you don't think there should be any funding funding limits or you have other ideas. So we are about half of the folks here today have participated. And uh, I think I could safely in the poll, but I do want to remind everyone that you can also take this via the link that we posted earlier and we'll we'll post that again later um, towards the end of the presentation today. So we have a pretty much the highest at the up to 500,000 mark and I will share those results now. All right. Uh. Yes, it's pretty even. <laughs> I'm not sure if <laughs> you guys are all about the same places that we are. We're like, what do we do? Um, 
you guys are uh, just about evenly split like us. So at this point, um, we're ready for just general comments and questions so far on what we've talked about. Um, we do have some more content coming up where Violet will be talking more about the planning capacity, um, building administrator and that those types of projects. But for now, we are wondering if there's any other projects, uh, types that should be eligible that we're missing and hopefully you've taken been able to take a look at that handout that had more details um and are there anything else that like elements of, of a project that are needed um for these to be successful and i see mike has his hand up first mike yeah i would say that um consistent with what i've been talking about uh that uh a car parking system which uh, increases equity and um, reduces driving uh, should be, I think it should actually be on that list it, because it's so powerful. Uh, it, there was uh, a, uh, someone else brought up what I called uh, car parking cash out where people were paid to not drive. And uh, that has been done in a number of cases. And I, I was able to put together a table as, as part of the, uh, the papers that I present. And it turns out that uh, introducing a price differential between the choice of driving and not driving makes an enormous difference. The worst case was 15% less driving. That was the worst case. And so, and free parking is everywhere. And uh, that's a total misnomer. I shouldn't have said it. You know, I, I meant free parking in quotes. Uh, and so there is um, great room for um, vast change because as soon as a vendor puts together a system and the employees like it, meaning a majority of the employees like it, and by the way, there has to be an add-in put in there so that the uh, drivers, uh, or the workers that drive every single day break even. They have to break even because uh, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, so you might think, well, who's gonna, where's the money gonna come from and who's gonna bid on that? I will just say, uh, I think everybody's heard of Ace Parking. Uh, it's a huge corporation, and uh, Keith Jones is the CEO, and he would love to do this system. I've spent a lot of time talking to Keith Jones. Uh, so uh, not that you don't just give it to the guy, but, but I mean, he would submit a proposal, and he would like to provide solution. Uh, once you have a car parking vendor that knows how to do this and has a record, and the employees actually appreciate the system being put in, he'll be in huge demand, everybody, because no company uh, wants to mismanage the, the employees' um, resources and car parking is, a, 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 it, it's for the employees. It's totally mismanaged. Uh, Mike, uh, Mike, I'm sorry, I must, I must have missed, um, what did you call this? That what's, what's the element, what's this project type called? Uh, car it is to implement a, um, car parking system, which is uh, an improved car parking system. Oh, improved just called system. an improved car parking system. That's what yeah, that's what that would be the project. Yeah. Okay. All and right. It would be very powerful and uh, it could do a lot. It could be transformational and, and give us a chance to stabilize the climate at a livable level. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, and then, yeah, you, so you mentioned the vendor. Okay, we'll put that down as uh, things to look into. Uh, Lorena, I believe you have your hand up again and you're, you want to chime in? I did. And I completely forgot what I was going to talk about. <laughs> Maybe well, we I were just talking about eligible projects, um, making sure that there's anything else that we should really consider and focus on anything. Maybe we should prioritize, um, from our handout. Yeah, let me, I'll come back to my question. <laughs> Absolutely. We've got, we'll be here for a little bit longer. Um, let's see, we have got Kevin Hamilton. Would you like to uh, tell us what your affiliation is? And oh, Sure, it's Kevin Hamilton. I'm the director of Central California Asthma Collaborative here in the San Joaquin Valley uh, with offices in Manteca, Fresno, and Bakersfield, Lamont. Um, we do a lot of work with schools and communities um, under the AB 617 sort of pathway, along with some other things. We're also working uh, 
on the CEC side, uh, first on block grant one, now block grant two. Uh, I really think there needs to be some kind of a, of a, at least an attempt uh, that's able to be documented within any of these electric vehicle uh, uh, projects where you would be bringing uh, electric school buses, uh, which we're huge supporters of, by the way, in, into these communities here in the San Joaquin where, you know, we, we have a hard time uh, getting the infrastructure in at the same time that we see the vehicles come in and the schools tell us this a lot. And since both programs are on the ground, uh, federal government's dumped even more money into electric school buses than they've ever had before. Uh, CARB's got money there. Uh, CEC's got money there. It would behoove you, I would think, to want to leverage each other's funding and to suggest that at the very least, uh, scores could be enhanced by demonstrating that uh, that partnership, that uh, leveraging in any proposal or plan for a proposal that uh, planning project that might come before you. So uh, block grant two, for instance, is gonna go for three to five years. Uh, we know we'll be seeing school bus money from the feds and from you guys for at least a couple of more years. So it's not like a project that's planned for next year couldn't at least commit to uh, developing those resources and exploring those options as part of their proposal uh, when they came to a final proposal, but it certainly should be built into the plan as a requirement. Um, yes, my yes. thoughts. Ex absolutely. Uh, clean mobility in schools, especially the school bus um, projects, uh, transitioning to zero emission takes a variety of partners um, to make it happen. Um, but yeah, and I'm excited to work with schools um, to to try and make it easier too. So I'm glad that you're here on the call and hope that you and can we're join working us for the with, next two. Just FYI, we're working with uh, six different schools up and down the valley from Stanislaus County down to uh, Kern right now. And they've all asked us about uh, electric school buses. Right. None of them have them. Uh, most of them are fairly small. Mm -hmm. uh, Delano Union, for instance, is one. Uh, they have six elementary schools, two middle schools, and a high school. So, I mean, it, it seems like this would be a good process to turn them on to and help them through. Does that sound right to you as well? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm hoping you can okay. um, help us get in touch with them too and bring them to the table next time. We have two more meetings. So we'll, we'll bring we those actually can help you get in touch with them and the folks in Los Banos and a couple of other communities as well. Great. Sure. Great. Great, to have, uh, great to have you on the call then, Kevin. Sure. So reach out to me afterward if you would. Thanks. Will do. Hey, can you, Kevin, you, if you, oh, I have your information. You registered. You do. I got it. <laughs> I All think right. half of CARB does actually, but yes. <laughs> okay, I'll just I'll just say, hey, um, Lorena, do you have your hand up? Oh, do you I remember do. what you're going to say? <laughs> I do, and now I have two points because I think Kevin brought up. So let me do, let me piggyback on what Kevin said, and I think there's a lot of, and I would like to see in in this sort of um, funding and guidance and things like that is looking at innovative ways to counteract traffic and to counteract. Um, how we get kids to schools. Obviously, active transportation should be one of the main um, goals. But I think one of the other ones is uh, a school bus electrification is, is a really big topic. And I think one of the th things that we have to look at is what are the alternatives to just turning a switch and making everything electric? Because there should be we should be looking at innovative ways to provide multimodal transportation because there are a lot of groups that maybe can't access, you know, I, I was just at an event in the Bassett Avocado Heights area where we received a very, um, di, you know, disadvantaged low income area. And we were just talking to families who couldn't afford the, the cost of the school bus because of the number of children that they had or that they didn't qualify for whatever the cost was per semester per student. And so we have to look at, you know, that's another thing when it comes to, you know, accessing um, transportation and, and for low free to low cost, but also providing other options because, you know, 
I hearken back to, and what's been great about this whole movement toward electrification is we're bringing back some auspices from, you know, a bygone year. For example, Vanpool is really big right now. And that's something that, you know, the 70s energy crisis kind of led us to really look at that as a model. But what we're seeing now is that, you know, maybe a model of Vanpool and carpool could be something that would work for schools, because at the end of the day, those who choose buses are going to choose buses and those who choose to take their kids to school in a car are going to choose to take their kids to school in a car. We have to find other options to incentivize people and to really encourage them to look at other modes of transportation. And that kind of moves into the point that I had forgotten uh, earlier was that you know, when it comes to these projects, I really think, and I think it's really been overlooked, is that at the core of any project that is, that we put out should be public education, because I think there are barriers to public education when it comes to what electrification really means. People think, oh, you're going to have me driving a Tesla space car at $100,000, when the truth is, is that, you know, there's a lot of other models that are more affordable, there's more accessibility to electric cars now, and there it's an immense kind of burden when it comes to providers who are currently providing in this space. We really need to look at education, educating the community on what options are out there. And I think too, you know, Green commuter is one that comes from a space of we want to work ourselves out of a job. There, people should be accessing transportation and the various modes, but there are still a lot of communities and populations where traditional trans, traditional bus transportation is not an option. And so we still need to look at and provide for those multimodal options. And so public education around what the options are would be really helpful to be built into programs. And I'm not just talking about community engagement, because of course, what people want is important, but also there's a lot that can be done to just educate community on what's out there. And I feel like that should be a requirement of any project coming out that that they'll do their due diligence to educate the community on electrification and what it means in terms of greenhouse gases and reducing emissions because at the end of the day and i think in some of our other like for example you know the tra transformative climate communities they really are looking at overall reduction of greenhouse gases and the only way to really do that effectively is to remove cars from the road and if every project addressed that in some way whether that's just through pure communication uh, excuse me pure education or whether that's from of course the project itself i still think that that's important and something that needs to be focused on absolutely Lorena, and that's why i'm so excited to to be working with Bree and Violet um, and the team I work with here at CARB on this new approach because we are trying to incorporate the school and what resources they already have. They're already good at so many things um, with educating the community and connecting the parents and the students and even the businesses in a school. So couldn't agree more. I'm super excited about this and exactly for some of the points you just brought up. We have some a new hand raised and then also I just want to do a time check real quick with my my coworkers. Um, do we have time for a few more questions? I see we have a new one from Richard, so I'm really wanting to hear from, from Richard. I hope we have time. Let, let's take Richard, Adria, and then move on. Does okay. that sound good? Sounds good. Richard, would you like to uh, state your name and affiliation? And Yes. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Richard Aviles. I am with the Other and Belonging Institute at UC Berkeley um, and currently provide technical assistance for our step grantees under the CARB um, program and thank you uh, Lorena for bringing up bringing up what you just brought up and I think definitely education is, has been part of um, much of the components of the work that we're doing with current projects and I think more on the grant administration side I think it'd be very beneficial um, a lot of the times at least one thing that we we've experienced is that a lot of the CBOs who are also grant leads um, on step projects transition from being service-based organizations or advocacy-based organizations to direct service organizations because of the impact of COVID um, and just the different needs that communities were having. So I would just suggest that maybe there is a way to create a structure for um, moments of reflection and process in, throughout the grant to assess some of these benchmarks that are being proposed. And rather than sort of, while like a quarterly report or a status report can do that, um, there, there might be possibility for a conversation or just like a moments and benchmarks for strategy sessions to how to redirect and pivot based on as um, feedback that is being collected in real time. 
Um, yeah, so it's just something that came to mind and I offer myself as well as a resource, if okay with the rest of the CARB team on the technical assistance side. Um, and if folks there, we have a process in, in our work called the community accountability process, but if folks are interested in, um, I would, you know, definitely Brie, Heather, Violet, feel free to share my email if folks want to get in contact um, in regards to technical assistance and what that looks like thus far. Great. Thank you so much. Um, it's good to hear from you too. So let's go with Adria and then we can move on. Hi. Um, Hi. Someone I was mentioning earlier, well, I thought about this. I was working on a grant with Caltrans and it was for marketing and kind of circa kind of circling around the outreach. And so I don't know if CARB has those dollars in place, but it would be really great if we were all singing the same song. So the marketing company worked with the community outreach organizations to develop one theme song that Caltrans would sing throughout the year. And that grant kind of comes up in different ways throughout um, their funding uh, process. So I don't know if there's room, but I just thought about that. Like. Sometimes we just aren't all singing the same song, but if the goal is to get to zero and get our carbon reduced, it seems like there should be something around us having even a, a marketing toolkit where we're all educating from the same basis instead of making up these different versions. And maybe there's a collective way we could do that. All right, sounds good. So let's move on and then we'll take, we'll uh, continue to, to take on uh, more have uh, sorry we'll we'll have more opportunities to hear from you guys again but let's just want to make sure we get through our content today Bree no Violet sorry you guys haven't heard really much from Violet there she is <laughs> yes I'm here so um we in terms of planning capacity building for the administrator solicitation, we need more long-term TA and planning assistance than the RFP we're releasing or we have released to support the project application uh, phase provides. So with that, um, this brings us to the second uh, solicitation, the administrator solicitation. So you'll see the two in the circle um, on the remaining slides, I believe. So. The TA and planning administrator has three main tasks that we've identified thus far. Uh, fully administer the planning efforts selected through the first solicitation process previously outlined today. Provide grant implementation technical assistance for planning, CMS, and STEP. This technical assistance will also encompass some level of administrative support for um, to the CMS and STEP projects, such as assisting uh, the grantees to develop project plans and prepare status reports and disbursement requests to submit to CARB. The final task is to help build capacity to sustain and expand successful practices into the future with applicants that were not yet prepared for grant funding at this time. So with that, we actually have um, another poll. We wanna be really upfront here um, about how much of the 5 million is going toward the technical assistance and administrative elements versus the funding that's allocated toward community-based projects. But we wanna get public feedback on this component to determine what that breakdown or that split should actually be. So I'm gonna launch a poll that um, pretty much addresses this and see what you all have to think about this. So I've just launched it. And the question is um, how much of the 5 million should go toward administration and TA versus the community-based pro project? So we have a couple of options, 2 million to administration and TA, which would mean 3 million goes to the community-based project or the reverse of that. So 3 million to administrative administration and TA and 2 million to community-based projects. If there's some other idea you have in mind, then um, we'd certainly like to, you know, hear your feedback on that piece. And I think we've got um, actually a good portion of um, those that are participating in the survey right now are suggesting the first option, the 2 million, but we do have a few others. Um, normally I would say, you know, if we have some quick responses to what other breakdowns that might look like, but I feel like we're, we have quite a few more slides to run through. So I'm gonna, uh, maybe we table that for a future discussion, um, our next work group, or we can, um, if you have ideas, you're also welcome to contact um, 
us to discuss that further. So did I share those results there? And then I am going to move on to our next slide. So we plan to solicit technical assistance providers and planning grant administrators that are experts in the field of equitable transportation planning and environmental justice and have the necessary competencies to help build organization and community capacity to participate in CARB funding opportunities and beyond. With Violet, you're muted. I wonder how long. <laughs> you said with. <laughs> oh, that's weird. It's just, yeah, with, okay. So with that, um, eligible applicants. You haven't heard this part yet, right? They'll be chosen based on public feedback, um, but our initial thinking is California-based organizations that have statewide, have a statewide reach or have multiple partners that cover the state, including nonprofits, tribal organizations and governments, but also public entities. So these we're thinking are entities that can exhibit, they have an organization mission that aligns with supporting transportation equity and have a history and extensive experience leading or collaborating with public agencies and nonprofit groups on a number of plans, projects, programs, and training on equity and environmental justice, public outreach and engagement, zero emission mobility, and active transportation master planning. So I have another poll for you all to participate in. Um, and I'm gonna launch that right now. This is specifically pertaining to the eligible entities. I'll launch that now. So what other types of entities should be eligible to provide PA and administer the planning capacity building projects if we haven't already identified those? So we have some ideas, institutions of higher education, consulting firms, philanthropic organizations, or perhaps there's some others that we haven't considered yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll now. We have a lot of interest in the um, consulting firms. I'd like to talk about um, as we go through this process. So let me um, move on to the some examples of the minimum level of activities needed to support technical assistance recipients. So of all these categories, we're thinking they all must be delivered using culturally appropriate materials and tailored to the needs of grantees and their partners implementing planning, themas, and step projects. So some examples include for capacity building, um, things like strategic planning or grant writing. For grant management, this would be more in line with administrative support, budgeting, keeping um, tabs on the status of the projects and tra tracking progress. For evaluation and impact assessment, this relates to data collection and analysis, but also identifying metrics for success. And then finally, um, equity support. Uh, so things such as trainings and um, help facilitating equitable community engagement and also participatory budgeting. So I'm going to launch our final poll that's per, I think I'm on a poll, yeah, okay um that pertains to this so we're we're curious about your thoughts on which types of implementation ta you think are most critical so we have um, the four categories that were just mentioned but we also welcome ideas on other types of responses and even though we won't be able to get to some of those others today or we could talk about it in our next um comments and uh, questions point uh, we also have this in our survey that's online. You can take that and provide a little bit more addition to your responses. But so far, the, um, I think a really huge piece that is being identified here is the evaluation and impact assessments, as well as capacity building. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share those results with you. So we're pretty much 
split, I mean, for evaluation and impact assessments and the capacity building pieces. Okay, um, so our next slide is um, us uh, talking through a potential approach that we wanna get some feedback on and that's using the TA and administrator funds to start building regional technical assistance teams including community ambassadors to deliver local place-based support and community guidance. The cost and efficiency benefits of this approach are, are numerous from improved regional project coordination and project identification to leveraging existing networks and investments across multiple funding sources. Though we recognize this requires considerable community support and it's important we take the time it's, it's important we take the time to discuss this idea and ensure we, we move toward a, an approach of designing based on those most impacted and often excluded from transportation planning decision making. So that is where we're going to take a, another stop for some comments and questions. I have a few specific questions um, on that topic, um, mainly what will it take to implement this approach and what features would make this approach most successful? So I just want to emphasize what um, what we're asking here is what is needed for community buy-in and the types of resources that are needed to make this happen, um, particularly what CARB's role is in this and making the right connections and ensuring communities have the space to build the social infrastructure to support and sustain this, this concept. So I'll stop there and um, see if we have any Questions again, um, please raise your hand if you um, want to share any of your thoughts on this particular approach. If you're calling in by phone, that's the number sign or number two. And then um, you can share your question with Ashley via a direct chat if you want her to read your question out loud. Um, Kevin Hamilton, you have your hand raised. Please feel free to unmute. And sure, I, I, I don't really have a question. It's more a comment in response to your your question. Um, we've been involved in this for a long time and watched the different projects uh, that Carb has launched over the last. 15 or 20 years, and not just CARB, but other agencies as well, with the goal of reaching down into the communities that are at most need and, and doing that in a genuine way that ends up benefiting those communities in a measurable way. And uh, which I was really pleased to see the evaluation piece score so high because our experience with our, our uh, uh, CBO partners in those communities uh, shows that measuring and, and evaluating is probably one of the most challenging things for them kind of develop those measurement evaluation plans. But at any rate, um, you know, the, the model is we're going to work with this uh, prime contractors, all this vocabulary you guys have developed over the years that can be really annoying. Uh, and then that individual, that company is going to somehow know who to reach to and uh, work with that's going to be the one that reaches out to the next level down to that uh, community in a way that uh, they can trust and feel that, uh, you know, all warm and cuddly about. So uh, we haven't seen that work out so well here in this region. I uh, can't speak for the rest of California, but I've been working up and down this region for uh, over 30 years now, so I could speak pretty well for that. Um, we feel very strongly that the approach needs to be made to uh, working with folks already working in communities in the region uh, or maybe regional uh, lead organizations that again have uh, groups of, of community-based organizations and um, local government agencies that they're working with on a regular basis. And th those folks are available. They, they often don't know how to approach these processes. So how do you how do you get to them? How do you find out? 
how do you find them? Uh, again, you have to go to those folks who have a reputation for uh, for being trusted messengers in these communities, as we call them, and as they call them, uh, people who have been working in the communities on various things, not just this for years, and uh, are able to actually bring projects uh, uh, to the place where the community can look at it and say, oh, wow, this is great. And we saw that come from here. Because what we hear back from residents is, um, they're very enthused in the first six months to a year that you start something like this. Uh, but then, you know, after they don't see anything, they don't see anything, they don't see anything, you know, they've been planned to death at this point. So they're not as enthusiastic anymore about getting involved in, in planning projects and, and seeing a lot of things happen on paper and giving a lot of uh, their time and energy to those things. And then it, it doesn't become anything. So the big question is always, you know, how do we demonstrate this on the ground? How do we make sure that uh, whoever is contracted by CARB to bring this, whether it's the planning part or the project part, uh, they should be linked as one actually uh, forward to completion. Um, you know, how do we check back again and see that uh, you can pull residents and they can say, yes, this project here was brought by this and we are so thankful for this. And I don't see a lot of that ever happening. So again, building that into this process and uh, we are really opposed to this idea of going back to the same three or four uh, groups that have been running these contracts for I don't know how long now. Not going to call anybody out or anything. Some doing pretty decent jobs at times, some not so much, but it does seem to cycle through uh, certain groups of folks. And, and by the way, we're not looking for that job. <laughs> Just full disclosure, we won't be submitting an application for this proposal or anything. But uh, we have noticed that, um, and we have noticed that when some of our partners have contracted with some of these folks, uh, they get very little money compared to how much the prime received compared to the amount of work that they're often expected to do. But because they're smaller nonprofits, they'll often take that on uh, and then are unable to uh, complete it or do it in a way that uh, is substantive and meaningful for that community. So I think, you know, sort of the way of doing business needs to change. And uh, at this point in time, I think that opportunity is there so i'm just just suggesting that rather than looking for one entity look for five you know spread it out uh, make sure that they are at very least regionally located and having an office there and having worked there for a long time and built relationships putting one person in an office in a building in one town in a in an entire region that does not mean that you work in that region so uh you know, I, I think it's really important for CARB to do its due diligence in this situation and make sure that um, they verify everything that's being said about what somebody's claiming they can do in these various areas. There's a lot of money uh, involved and a lot of potential uh, good things that can be done with it. And uh, we've seen far too much of that money go past and um, not a lot of it seeming to hit the ground and do the things that it it could have and should have done. So, thank you. Thank you for your comments, suggestions, Kevin. Um, Violet, I just wanted to bring up the time again. I'm so sorry, yeah. but we've we've got one more slide, and then we we have, and then we'll then we would be done. So I just wanted to see if you wanted to um, trim down your number of comments you take right now. Um, yeah, I um, I think we can take comments. We have two hands up from um, uh, Adria. it looks like Adria and Marina. I believe you had your hand up at one point. So if we could take those comments and then we'll we'll conclude. Um, we'll try to wrap up some of our comments received in um, via chat, and then we'll we'll conclude our discussion for the day. So with that, um, Adria, please uh, feel free to unmute and. Um, share any thoughts you have or questions thank you um i want to compliment my name is adria by the way with it, like maria um 
and I, it's easy to pronounce wrong, but I'm trying to get more used to telling people it's wrong. So anyway, um, so it, it's Adria, and I wanted to compliment the gentleman that just spoke. Um, you know, as an advocate and, and representative of my community and the African American community, he's targeting like all the things that we hate about this process. Um, in San Diego, they actually started a group of um, all the climate um, organizations and discussing regionally within San Diego County or the city, yeah, San Diego County, how we can all come to the table and find an equitable way forward. And I think it's really, really responsible of an organization like yours to take that approach. Um, and even maybe like regionally, that regional person is really just responsible for finding like who's at the table that's really doing the work. And, and those become your ambassadors because without them, the work can't be done. So as a developer, I hired a local, I'm building in a affordable housing community and literally hired the person that's on the ground, the community organization that's on the ground. And I gave them more money than they've ever gotten to do outreach for me. Um, and that's the main complaint all day long is they don't, and they're mad when people, oh, well, you do this. And most people are coming, the prime is usually coming with like, will you volunteer to do this? Well, they're already volunteers, most of them. And so it's just not fair and equitable. So I thank you so much for that. And um, that's all I really had to just compliment him for his stake in the game on that. Thank you. Uh, and then I believe, I don't know if your hand's still up, but did you still want to share anything, Lorena? Or are you I did, I did, but Audria definitely took a lot of my thunder because I was going to piggyback on that. Um, you know, especially from an equitable standpoint. Um, you know, we're in these very disadvantaged communities. For example, our project in Watts, where the community was promised a lot of things in the past that didn't deliver, and I think that that is something that's so important from the ground up and to really as both Kevin and Audria I'm sorry I'm I heard you and I, I like I'm Afro Latina so my name Lorena often gets mispronounced as well so I'm right there with you so I'm doing the best that I can but um you know being able to exist in some of these spaces definitely from an equitable standpoint needs to be first and foremost with whoever is on the call or whoever's at the table and I I think that that includes technical assistance and I think that it's a very good starting point and I think that's I would like to see those uh, those uh, technical assistance dollars really go forward in really making a lot of these projects the most equitable that they can be because I think there's still a lot of room um, for providing for like I said before public education but also for you know a seat at the table and I think most projects I believe do have to have some sort of you know higher local type of um, you know, uh, language and, and move forward. But there's a difference between, as you know, Audrey put it, as just hiring locally versus really economically impacting the local and regional area when it comes to these disadvantaged, low income and disproportionately underrepresented communities. And so I really definitely feel like that should start with, you know, the technical assistance providers as well. Thanks for that. And um, yes, thanks for, for all the, the comments at this point. Uh, I think we have a few general questions or perhaps some comments in chat that we are going to read off. Um, one simple question that I received that I can um, easily reply to is if we're going to, well, we're gonna provide the recording for this and share that with the participants once that's available, I believe, right? We'll, We'll figure out a way to notify everyone of, of that. And then um, it will be posted in the same location that the slides were available. And I'll uh, go over that in just a moment as well. And I did get one question that requested or asked our projects that incentivize cost-effective investments in workplace EV charging part of these programs. And this question came from James Frey. And I think for the planning side of things, I can certainly say that I, I think this is an, a, an opportunity to, depending on who the lead applicant is, 
to have like a partnership network that looks at this piece um, in terms of, of planning this effort out. So I think that absolutely could be an element, um, but I certainly like to hear if Bree and Heather have some additions to that. Um, I guess I'll just add that I agree that it probably wouldn't be standalone. Um, we we can look at whether we need to clarify something in the eligible projects to to for that um, type of project to see whether um, we actually think it should be eligible. Eligible, I will say that you know, especially for STEP, which is really meant to fund projects that have um, some sort of VMT reducing capacity, like straight EV charging without some sort of shared component typically wouldn't reduce VMT. So that's something to consider too, but um, that's not to say it couldn't be a component. Could you pull up the last slide, Brie, since we're about to yes. put that in? I was just gonna add like for a school, uh, it usually is a workplace too. <laughs> so yeah, that's definitely something we can put on on our list. Ashley, did you have a comment in the chat? Um, previous comment only at this point. Yeah. Um, so the Oceanside Bike Ped Committee has an Oceanside employee, Howard, who's always looking for grants. We're trying to get the NCTD, which is a transit district, to include a good car parking system at their um, redesigned Oceanside Transit Center. Please send me the slides, which I did, um, to make sure that um, Howard and Tom have this information, who is the committee chair. Thanks. And Heather, did you have anything in the chat? No, it was the same question that Violet already had shared. Okay. okay. So that concludes our discussion for today. Um, I just, again, want to throw out the reminder that, that um, the poll questions are available for you to complete through an online sur survey, and um, Ashley's going to post that link again, um, which this was already mentioned, but we will uh, post the, the recording, and this will be done by December 26th. Uh, we have our next work group scheduled for January 18th, so you should be seeing the notice uh, for that. Uh, come, go out next week, I believe. And then uh, the TA RFP that is out. So please, if you're interested in that, um, look that information up and we can provide that as well. Um, we have our contact information available for you if you have any additional questions or if you want to talk through any of the programs that we uh, discussed today. Uh, we also welcome the opportunity for any meetings to attend that with your partners or um, you know other dedicated discussions to go over this information. And then finally, we have a subscribe button. So the Clean and Sustainable Mobility Options is a place where you can receive all the notices for our upcoming solicitations, as well as the work group notices and things like that. So we thank you for your time and appreciate all your suggestions and ideas shared with us today and uh, have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks. You too.